Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Shh. 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 Okay, um, I'll just make the usual administrative announcements before I turn things over. Uh, please remember to throw away your trash after uh, the brown bag today. Please remember to recycle anything that can be recycled. Please remember to uh, silence your cell phone. And uh, if you're taking the course associated with the brown bag, the sign-up sheet is uh, over there on the podium. Um, uh, I'll make a plug for next week's uh, brown bag, which are going to be some uh, researchers from Copenhagen are going to be over here uh, through the auspices of our good friend Jay Bolter. Jay's not here to make a pitch for it, is he? No, we're Jay free. Okay. Um, so I think that's it for announcements. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Rahul, who's going to talk about NerdFest. <laughs> Earthfest. Nerd Nerdfest. Nerdfest, okay. I guess my hearing is uh, gone too. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rahul Basoli. I'm a faculty member in the School of Interactive Computing and a member of the Visualization Group. Two of my uh, colleagues are not here today, uh, John Stasko and Alex Endert. They're out in the Midwest participating in a uh, national workshop. But it's really a pleasure for me to uh, present to you a number of papers and posters that we'll be presenting at VIS. VIS is the leading, the flagship conference of the visualization community. Um, it's been hosted for a number of years and uh, it's back in the US after a stint in Paris last year. It actually turns out that Georgia Tech has a fantastic uh, participation in VIS and I tried to put down a few numbers. Uh, on, on how we were presented. So this is actually three conferences packed together. It's about InfoVis, which focuses on information visualization. Then there's VAST, which focuses on visual analytics, science, and technology. And there's also SciVis, which is uh, scientific visualization. And we have participation in all three of these conferences. Um, we'll be heading up to the Windy City of Chicago and it turns out that we have a fantastic um, number of people in the conference. So we have two program committee organizers, that's John and Alex. We also have Polo Chow, who is on the program committee of the uh, Exploring Graph at Scale workshop that Dr. Bader, the chair of uh, CSE, is chairing. Uh, we have eight papers. We have four posters two workshops, Business Vis and Exploring Graph at Scale. And I really did a rough estimate of maybe 30 plus people. Although when I just talked to Dr. Foley, I think there might be maybe closer to 40 or 50 people participating at this conference. Um, so it's gonna be a fantastic venue for Georgia Tech. And um, what we'll be doing today is we'll be previewing a few of the talks um, that we will have at the conference. So what we're going to do is there are going to be eight presentations. Um, the first paper will get a little bit of a longer time. Uh, it's a full paper. The other ones will try to shorten up. Um, so we'll have papers and posters. What you'll see here is a, is a nice uh, touchscreen display. I tried to tell everyone that you could do live demos, but live demos always fail. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is hopefully do it during the talks, or if you want to see it afterwards, that's great. Um, all the participants and presenters will be here to, to demonstrate their tools. So we'll kick it off with Hannah. Um, and what you're seeing here is actually just the names of the presenters. There's a lot of collaborators that are along with them. But Hannah's going to kick us off with InterAxis, um, steering scatterplot axis via observation level interaction. What I'm going to do is um, Hannah's got uh, 10 minutes for her talk. Um, I'm going to give her a warning at three minutes. And when I stand up, she has to stop. And I'm going to do that for the other folks as well, OK? All right, Hannah, you start off. I have your slides here. Hi, I'm Hannah Kim. Uh, thank you for, the introdu uh, uh, for introducing me and also warning me. So um, uh, my paper is called Inner Access, uh, which is short for Interactive Access. Uh, which is a uh, novel visual analytics technique that steers scalar plot axis using observation level interaction. Yes, okay. Uh, this is a joint work with Dr. Chu, Dr. Park, Dr. Endert uh, in Georgia Tech. 
So uh, the, the motivation of this work come from these questions. How would you visualize high dimensional data? For instance, uh, this is a famous uh, car data uh, data set from 2004. Uh, for every car, we have uh, data attributes like uh, retail price, uh, dealer costs, uh, number of cylinders, horsepower, et cetera, et cetera. So we, ha we have like these so many attributes and how can you visualize these many attributes into a 2D screen space? That uh, was the question. And uh, an obvious way would be using a scatter plot. So uh, you pick uh, two of these attributes. Uh, here we picked uh, miles per gallon versus weight. And to see, uh, to explore more, we have to pick another combination of attributes such as uh, miles per gallon versus cylinders and weight versus horsepower. So basically you have to pick two of the uh, attributes and just iterate through them to explore the data. And another uh, way is to just use all the combinations of these data attributes to uh, draw a scatter plot matrix. In here, you see all of the uh, combinations of data uh, attributes in a scalar plot in a matrix form. And another uh, alternative is a uh, parallel coordinates visualization. Uh, so uh, in these uh, three kinds of visualization, uh, an axis is represented by a single attribute, like a number of cylinders or weight, something like that. So. Um, what happens if the data have hundreds, thousands, or even millions of attributes? These uh, three kinds of visualization doesn't work anymore. So um, one solution is a uh, dimension reduction technique. So for instance, we have uh, principal component analysis, multidimensional scaling, uh, generative uh, topographic mapping, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in these dimensional reduction techniques, uh, you uh, basically just reduce the dimension into uh, reduce the dimensions of, of uh, high dimensional data into uh, two dimensional data. So in these cases, uh, an axis is represented by multiple features. So in these cases, uh, these are the some examples. Uh, I think this one is MDS and TSNE, and this is force directed layout. So in uh, in these kind of visualizations. Um, you cannot really uh, understand uh, what it means to have a high value on the x-axis or what it means to have a low value in, these, uh, in the y-axis. Because uh, sometimes these kind of techniques uh, doesn't have a clear meaning of an axis. So, uh, in, in some techniques such as um, MDS or force directed layouts, they are rotation invariant, meaning that if you uh, rotate the visualization itself, it doesn't change the meaning. So, which means that the axis is not defined at all in those kind of visualizations. So, the two question here is that how can we interpret the x and y axis in these scenarios, and can we even interact with them? So, that those are the questions we try to answer in this paper. So, uh, we wanted to uh, create a technique so that scatter plots are interpretable and also interactive. So um, we, uh, for an axis, we use this bar chart. So, so a, a bar chart represents an axis so that we could really interpret the, what's the meaning of the axis. So for instance, uh, this, uh, this y-axis is represented by a linear combination of um, this wagon, uh, all-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, and sports car, uh, the linear combination of these attributes. So now that we could interpret an axis using this bar chart, uh, we introduce uh, two kind of observation level interaction. So uh, what, what's an observation level interaction? So in traditional uh, dimension reduction techniques, um, a user can interact with the model by just changing the parameters. For instance, um, say in the force directed layout, you just change the, num uh, the value of uh, force coefficient and see what's the difference between before and after. But in here, the user can uh, interact with the uh, visualization object itself. So this uh, observation level interaction reflects the user's intent uh, directly into the visualization. 
So uh, two kinds of uh, observation uh, level interaction we are providing is uh, data level interaction and feature level interaction. So the the first one is uh, data level interaction, meaning that users move those uh, data items around or drag and dra uh, drop those data points uh, in order to find the data features uh, that can uh, quantify this, uh, their preferences onto this axis. And uh, feature level interaction is that the user can directly manipulate the features by just uh, moving or increasing or decreasing these uh, bars on the uh, bar chart. So uh, these two kinds of interactions could uh, steer the scatterplot axis so that user could make a visualization that they want. So um, I will just demo the uh, tool. Uh, so uh, this live demo is on my website uh, if you want to browse them later. Okay. Uh, can you see the letters here? Yeah. So um, this, uh, uh, this tool is uh, consists of three views, basically. The middle one is the uh, normal uh, scale plot. And two uh, axes is represented by these two green boxes and one uh, bar chart. So uh, these two green boxes and uh, bar chart represent x axis, and those two green boxes and that uh, bar chart represents y axis. And if you uh, mouse over these uh, data items, it just uh, the right pane shows the details uh, of the data items highlighted. So uh, this is the car data uh, visualization I just showed. And let's uh, see, oh, yeah, let's say we are shopping for a car. And I want to find what kind of data, uh, data attributes I care. So I, I know what kind of car that I like and I, kind of, I, I know what kind of car I don't like, but I don't know what kind of data attributes I'm looking for. So I drag these, uh, let's say I like Jaguar, so I put this in, in this uh, high drop box, and let's say I don't like this Pontiac car, so I drop this into this box. So the axis is now updated so that the, the cars similar to the uh, Jaguar one would be placed on the right side, and the car similar to the Pontiac one would be placed on the left side. So uh, if you see those axes, now I can see that I really care about uh, sports cars and uh, horsepowers and cylinders, and I really don't like um, sedans. So uh, this is how the visualization works. And so the mathematical uh, formula behind the scene is very simple. Uh, you, you have uh, the two semantic groups, the cars that I like and the cars that I don't like. You just find the centroids of each of them, and you subtract them to find the axis vector. And you project the other data items onto this axis vector to find the new coordinates in the updated visualization. So it's pretty simple. So in conclusion, uh, inner axis creates a complicated axis as a simple linear combination of data attributes, and it allows a, a seamless interaction of users yeah, using the, those two kinds of uh, data level and data attribute level interactions. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hyunwoo Park. I'm a student of Dr. Vasoli, uh, working on a server visual analytics project. And uh, today, uh, the paper I'm going to uh, brief, brief to you is a visual analytics uh, system applied to the healthcare setting. 
So this is a workshop paper for uh, the track called Visual Analytics in Healthcare. And uh, as with other uh, uh, development process, we started with collecting design requirements from clinicians and the field experts. And then uh, they have basically three groups of needs about visualizing and understanding the, their data. So the data is basically uh, a number of patients going through uh, emergency department uh, at, at the Children's Hospital of Atlanta. Uh, and so the three, three requirements were first is that they want to see a good visual summary of uh, how well they are doing in terms of uh, improving patients' health status. And then based on that performance measures, they want to categorize patients. So uh, who, who got improved and who didn't got, get improved, et cetera. And that is one requirement. And another requirement was that they want to compare those defined cohorts and then what cares was were given to the improved patient versus which type of activity was done to the worsened patient. So uh, that comparison is another requirement. And the uh, last requirement was that they want to see their data in various uh, visual representations, including the traditional table view. So they are very familiar with the table view like in Excel so that they can sort by uh, performance metrics or other patient characteristics like age or gender. So let me just quickly go through the, each of the slides. So this is our dashboard uh, uh, where the, the investigator will land on uh, at the first uh, at the, in the beginning, and the, uh, we identify six uh, key performance metrics for the patient population, and then they can uh, cross-filter across different uh, dimensions, and then they dynamically define uh, interested cohorts using these cross-filters, so using this dashboard. And then based on that, define cohorts, they can view the patients uh, in a table form or the list of providers who, who has given care to those patients and then they can basically rank providers based on the improvement uh, prov uh, they made and uh, how, how much they charged uh, for each type of cohorts, etc. So you can see the overall performance metric for uh, a number of provider or a number of activities. And then we provide uh, uh, several other visual representations, including tree maps, which highlights the uh, proportion of composition of activities done to uh, a set of patients. So we can quickly identify uh, which activities are most commonly done and how well those activities are associated with a certain type of outcome. And Obviously, we have scatter plot, which has very intuitive meaning to uh, normal clinicians. And since we are uh, this, the nature of this data is uh, a sequence of event. Uh, we are also interested in not only uh, a single activity associated with a certain outcome. We are interested in a series of activities and how a certain, let's say, pieces of sequences are associated with certain outcome, better or worse outcome, or more money or less money. So we use the Sankey diagram to uh, visualize the most common patterns in, uh, in the care process for a certain predefined cohort. And then we also allow the cross cohort comparison uh, using the same dashboard interface so that uh, investigator can compare two cohorts efficiently. And then uh, the last one is uh, kind of challenging and new type of investigation we have. So uh, they established a care flow guideline and then that is kind of normative guideline that 
uh, in which uh, they should provide care uh, based on that. So uh, we are trying to visualize how well they are uh, they are abiding by them themselves to the documented care uh, process, and then uh, which part uh, breaks down and. Uh, where our anomalies arise, and we are helping uh, them identify those uh, no abnormal activities based on the pre-documented guidelines. Yeah, thank you. Am I good on time? Thank you. <laughs> Peter here. Okay, so I'm Peter Pollack. I'm working with Dr. Chow and also Dr. Basoli and Brian and Shang for Georgia Tech. We are also making a system for health analysts to understand mobile health data. So you can think about mobile health data as being from mobile health sensors uh, like Apple Watch or Fitbit. And it comes with some interesting properties that I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, so you can look at the top right. This is the data that we're... This is the data... That is, it, is this, yeah, it's working, right? Okay. This is the data that we're working with at the top right. Uh, you have red smoking events, if you can see those, and also blue activity events. Uh, so I thought they was gonna come up step by step, but some of the properties that we're working with with this mHealth data is temporality, of course. So this is very dense time series data. Uh, we also have high dimensionality. So when we're working with multiple sensors, we also have multiple participants with, with each of these sensors. Uh, so you can imagine how, as we scale up to more participants, this gets increasingly complex. Uh, and both of these things together kind of turn into high volume. So we need to come up with the algorithms to support the amount of data that we're working with. Uh, also, something interesting about this data is high uncertainty. Uh, so where we're working with self-reports, maybe we have an abstinent smoker and we want to know whether or not they've actually smoked. You can understand that there's some un uncertainty involved in this. We also have inferred variables uh, like probability of stress. Uh, and there's some uncertainty that we need to represent in this as well. So moving on, we have this event data. We've discretized these quantitative values into raw events. And what we do next is we take these events and we mine them for frequent sequences to find the frequent patterns across. Is this working? OK. Thanks. Yeah, OK, it's like very close. OK. Uh, the frequent sequences across multiple days, across multiple participants. Uh, so to introduce the interface, uh, we have this right here. You can see on the bottom, we have our events occurring across six participants over here. And what we do is we take the frequent sequences from them and allow the user to choose which ones they're interested in. Uh, so I might not have time to explain the scatter plot, but the idea is that it's a distribution of frequencies uh, based on whether they're happening multiple times a day, uh, frequently in the day, or rarely in the day, but across multiple days. So when we allow the user to select one of these frequent sequences, we're looking at the sequences of events that happen before and after. Uh, so what we're doing is we're taking this temporal data and turning it into something chronological so we can think about order instead of just trends in the data. So of course we use frequent sequence mining to do this, uh, which is nice because we get some entry points for the data. Uh, we get some very interesting patterns that are occurring across all participants that we can start to work with uh, right when the interface loads. And we can also represent frequencies, frequent sequences visually uh, and think about how events are separated in terms of time or how sequences are separated in terms of time. So what we see over here in this diagram is an example of sequence alignment. Uh, so we're taking a sequence and we're specifying it and seeing what's happening before and after. Uh, so this is kind of a follow-up to event alignment, where instead of just selecting a specific event and seeing what's before and after it, we're selecting a sequence and seeing those sequences that are before and after. So what's interesting about this is you heard about co cohort exploration, or you heard about cohorts a little bit before, uh, but what this allows you to do is define multiple sequences that actually define a specific cohort of participants. So you can think about multiple participants all having a smoking event. Uh, then you can think about a smaller subset of those participants having smoking event followed by high stress, followed by high activity. Uh, so for example, you can append multiple sequences to each other uh, to define a more specific query or subset of these participants. And we can also see the sequence of events that happen in between them by clicking that plus. Uh, so that kind of wraps up what we've done so far. Uh, there's still a lot, lot of work to be done. Uh, specifically in terms of event discretiza discretization. So I talked a little bit about the event uncertainty and the variability. So we need some more flexibility in how these events are defined. Uh, right now we're doing thresholds over the raw sensor data to determine this is a low event, this is a medium event, this is a high event in terms of stress or activity. Uh, but we need health analysts to be able to define them themselves. 
So you can think about looking at trends, whether or not a, a value is rising or falling, or in terms of motifs, which is whether or not a pattern is happening over and over again over time in the quantitative data. Uh, you can also think about combining multiple data streams into one. For example, we might want a high data stream in one area, but we might also want to look at a data stream that's low in another area at the same time. There's a challenge visually also to think about, uh, of course, you're going to run out of colors and shapes eventually, so how are you going to get all these data streams for all these participants in the same area? Uh, so I think I'm good on time. Yeah. That's everything. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Robert Pienta. I'm speaking on behalf of a decent sized group of people here, um, some of which are at Georgia Tech and some of which are elsewhere now. Uh, and uh, essentially what we've come up with is a tool to explore graphs, not at the large graph summarization level, but at a more discrete lower level. Uh, because in fact, there's many tasks in which you want to have, you know, a small exploration of the graph rather than just a massive summary. Uh, so, you know, modern networks are gigantic and there's a lot of work on how do we summarize them, how do we show it. Um, and it's challenging, but we're not trying to solve this problem, right? Because for our tasks, you know, consider you're a, you're a researcher and you know one paper or a few papers and you want to walk through a citation network of papers to find something that's close to what you were working on, but, you know, not, you know, novel or from a slightly different area. Um, and so we're, we're really interested in how do you walk through a graph uh, and how can we help people do that on today's giant graphs. Um, for this, we created Adaptive Nav, which is a navigational system where you pick a starting node. We show some of the neighbors of that starting node, because if you imagine a given node may have millions of neighbors in some of today's graphs. So basically, we have to pick a way to show you only a subset of the neighbors. You can't even draw all the neighbors for some of these graphs. And so what we do is we offer several different uh, techniques for you to rank the neighbors and then show only a subset. Uh, so we have standard metrics like importance, degree. Um, so importance being something like page rank, right? So we'll show only the neighbors that have high page rank. But then in this paper, we also come up with uh, a method for showing surprising nodes and subjectively interesting nodes based on what you've already clicked on. Uh, so there's several parts to our visualization. Uh, the part on the left, you know, is the conventional uh, list view uh, with some of the details. Uh, the middle part is what you see as you uh, walk through the graph. And there's some color coding there, which I'll talk about. And then um, on the right, there's uh, basically an individual summarization pane and a user profile summarization pane. So the idea being that maybe you start with uh, a single paper you know, or in this case it's movies, you start with a single movie you know, uh, and we show some of the neighbors of that movie. Uh, it starts off by showing the important ones. Um, but as you click more nodes and sort of expand through this graph, uh, we build up a profile of what you've looked at. And we use that profile to recommend things based on any common features that the things you've clicked on had. Right? So if, if you're looking at uh, certain papers and only papers from a certain conference are things you're clicking on, uh, we'll be able to, to detect that and start ranking new nodes by that. And so as you click, we'll, we'll lead you towards things um, in, in the direction that, uh, that you are going. Um, and then the color coding here um, combines both subjective user interest, so this, this, we're modeling your interests as you search through things, as well as some surprisingness. And I can't get into too many of the technical details on how we measure surprisingness, but essentially uh, we look at that node's place in a distribution compared to the global distribution, um, and things that vary a lot from the global distribution, you'll, you'll tend to find surprising. Um, and so th the whole idea here is that we show only a subset of the graph, but the right subset. And by allowing people to pick the subset, whether through importance or just by measuring what they've clicked on so far, uh, we can turn you know, a very large hairball graph. Oh, I guess this doesn't have an animation. Well, imagine you, know, you have a large hairball graph, and you can turn it into um, uh, a smaller, uh, more coherent graph that's tuned to what you're interested in as you explore it. Uh, that's that's it. Um, if you have any questions, ask me afterwards. I'll be excited to talk about it. <laughs> Good afternoon.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arjun Srinivasan. I'm a second year master's student. I work with Dr. Rahul Basule. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a system which we call the Enterprise Genome. It's basically a visualization system which lets users gain a macro and micro level understanding of uh, companies and their alliances over time. Uh, a little about the data for this demo, we're using data from the Thomson Reuters SDC platform. It has 155 firms, about 11,500 alliances over a period of 25 years. Further, each alliance can be one or more of seven types. It can be between companies from different nations, different market segments, or uh, even across more than two companies. Uh, I'll just show a quick demo of the system as it is today. So the first thing which comes up is uh, the color coding for the different alliance types. Uh, so you can see that there are seven uh, alliance types in our case, so seven different colors. A uh, user can go ahead and drop in a company here. So each row in this, uh, each column in this visualization is one relationship or alliance, and each row is one type of alliance. Uh, each company can, you can see that each alliance can be more than one types and it's color coded by the same things, which you, same colors which you see above. Uh, filtering is simple, you can just hover over the filters to apply them or click on one of them to keep them. Uh, let's say a user, initially uh, you can see that it's all populated based on the sequence of the occurrence of the alliance. So the column, uh, the axis on top is basically going to be a count. So it's, uh, you can see that IBM over 25 years has about 800 alliances in this case. Uh, as a user, you might be interested in seeing uh, what time periods was it more active in versus, you know, which were more uh, inactive time periods. You can just switch to the temporal view, uh, which lays out the relationships by time. So you can see that in the case of IBM, it's been very popular in the 90s or it was more active during the 90s. And after that, it's kind of uh, decreased the number of alliances that forms with other firms. Uh, further, if you were interested in a particular period in time, you can brush over it to get a zoomed view of that period below it and uh, details about the zoomed period or the brushed period can be found like uh, by just going into the details panel which lets you see the most uh, active partners, the segments, the countries which were more active with IBM and its alliances during that time period. Uh, and further, if as a user, let's say you want to see uh, during the time period of 1994 to 1998, if IBM formed, let's say, a strategic alliance, what would be the next most probable alliance that IBM would form? You can go into the sequence view, and you can see uh, that IBM had a 89% chance of forming a strategic alliance, given that it uh, most recently formed a strategic alliance. And further, you can just hover over these edges and use them as filters as well. Uh, there are many other features like, you know, having cross-border filters, having uh, them across regions, across countries. Uh, but this is pretty much it. And uh, the other option is to add in more uh, companies and be able to lay them out in whatever order the user prefers. So that's what we have today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew. I worked with Chad, Romick, and John last year to take Dust and Magnet and put it on uh, this this fancy toy. Um, so it's it's just Dust and Magnet on a touch screen, and we, uh, our main mission was to try to explore what it would be like to take a system originally designed for a uh, keyboard and mouse kind of environment and then put it onto a screen where you can have, say, multiple people using it or, you know, like one person, multiple touch points. So... The original system, uh, for people that aren't familiar of Dust and Magnet, is uh, a way to visualize multivariate data sets. Uh, 
where the the squares on the screen uh, are these things right here are the magnets they'll be data attributes and the dots on the screen are dust which represent the um, the actual data themselves, like a row and a table. So depending on uh, the values of that dust in the uh, table, they'll be pu pulled uh, more closer to one magnet or another. Let's see. So um, yeah, the, the old system you know, looks like it was designed 10 years ago, you know, with menus and uh, lots of different windows. So. <laughs> um, uh, our mission was to take advantage of the touch screen, um, simplify the interface, make it more intuitive and uh, interactive, and also allow collaboration. So let's see. The first thing we did was uh, move it from multiple windows to a single screen, uh, as you can, I guess. Oh, okay. So uh, you, you know, it's either here or on the slides, but um, the, the single screen, uh, we wanted to make the visualization itself uh, as large as possible. So we had collapsible menus on the side that you can drag in and out, um, and then like hide features inside the display itself. Um, resizing magnets is a pinch gesture rather than you know, like a menu option on the side. Uh, let's see, moving multiple magnets is possible as well because it's a touch screen, so you can just drag them around or multiple people can work on it at the same time. And then, oh, okay. Uh, removing magnets involves just dragging it into the bottom right corner. <laughs> and, okay, and then the, uh, the other main thing we did was in the old system, uh, the dust would only move when you were dragging or like moving around a magnet. So if you wanted things to settle into like an equilibrium state, you would actually have to click and drag and kind of like shake a magnet until all the dust settled. Uh, what we did instead to make it more interactive was to have the dust constantly moving, always trying to go to an equilibrium state, which would mean that it would tend to uh, cluster up into groups and like block, you know, you, would, uh, you wouldn't be able to see all the uh, data all at once just like here where they're all clustered in the middle. So if you tap anywhere on the screen that's empty, um, they'll start push, pulling each other apart and that way they'll separate a little bit and then um, you, know, you could toggle by tapping on the screen again. And yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, we identified some useful features that uh, would be nice to have in the system uh, that were present either in the old, uh, old visualization or like just like during our own testing. One of them obviously is a detail view where you can actually see what the uh, data is in some kind of table. And um, an, the ability to do inverse magnets would be useful because if you paired an inverse magnet with the regular magnet, uh, that would allow you to form a kind of axis and then actually be able to plot out uh, data that way with other uh, variables. All right, thank you. So I'm going last, so I guess I have to fill 20 minutes uh, as opposed to five. <laughs> uh, so I, I, my name is Alex Godwin. Uh, I work in the, uh, vis uh, the Information Interfaces Lab under John Stasco. I'm a third year PhD student in the Human Centered Computing Program. I'm going to be talking to you about Space Sketch. Uh, we're also going to be showing a demo of the Dustin Magnets and Space Sketch after. So if you want to take a look at them, we have plenty of time. Uh, come up, you get to play with cool multi-touch and pen-based interaction methods. So, uh, Space Sketch is a system for doing sketch-based spatiotemporal visualization. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that means and give you a quick demo up here as well. But first, I want to see a quick show of hands if you are a programmer or if you can do scripting, you know coding in some way. So programmers, raise your hands. It's exactly what I expected to see in this crowd. Okay, so for you, if you wanted to look at a map of data, right, you can imagine drawing maps of it using code, right, creating interesting visualizations, renderings, and other ways of looking at the data. Now, that's, that's all well and good, but for many non-programmers, this is a much more challenging prospect. So one of the most common ways is to actually draw data directly on maps, through sketching, through moving icons onto maps, there are just a, a number of tools that are much more challenging without access to programming. And that's sort of what we're looking at. How do you combine the benefits of computational analysis that a programmer might have with some of the more natural interactive uh, methods that you would get by drawing directly on, say, paper? Okay. So 
Uh, this is the basic interface for Sketchbase. I'm going to try and swap it over. I think I can do that. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, here we go. So here you can see the area around Atlanta, um, specifically Midtown. And uh, if we wanted to look at some sort of data, say uh, crime for the last year, one of the ways that we could do that is to, be, is to drop points directly for each of the crimes that have occurred. Now, uh, one of the things that you can immediately see is this is actually kind of challenging to make plans around, to, to reason about. You see lots of dots, but can you really tell the difference between areas that have a lot of congestion versus areas that only have some congestion? Right? So what we're doing is providing a sketch-based way of interacting with that data. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, let's say, get from Georgia Tech's campus to Little Five, uh, you would just draw a line directly from one to the other. And what the system actually does is it interprets the line that you've drawn and uses it to create a shortest path and then shows you the information for the crime that would have occurred along that line. Then if you wanted to make an annotation, uh, you can do that as well, or use the eraser to get rid of it. Uh, if you wanted to then start uh, trying to figure out which regions might have more or fewer crimes, you just sketch a boundary around it, and then you can compare those to each other by the relative shading. Okay, So fairly straightforward sketch-based interaction methods. Um, again, if you wanted to explore the region, uh, around, say, Little 5 and see just how much crime occurs in each of the walking paths, uh, you can do that as well, and the system will fill in the details for you. Uh, so again, uh, sketch-based methods for non-programmers to explore spatiotemporal data. And come see me if you want to play around with this, if you want to check out how interesting your neighborhood is in terms of crime data. Uh, yeah, so we'll be here. Thanks. We have one more video that Dr. Ender wanted me to show. So you have to listen to his voice now, but not to his thing. Okay, let's try this. Are we good, Alec? Good. In this video, we introduce a mixed initiative visual analytics system called the Active Data Environment. Active Data is a spatial workspace created to support analysis via task recommendations invoked by inferences on user interactions within the workspace. To demonstrate, we use the vast challenge 2014 dataset about a fictitious kidnapping. Here we begin a new workspace by entering an initial seed, gas tech, in green. The Active Data Assistant attempts to infer the user's activity and executes the related task models. These task models may retrieve data or run more sophisticated analysis. The resulting data is presented to the user in gray recommendation cards. For Gas Tech, the system responds with recommendations summarized on gray cards for employees, organizational structure, and document references to Gas Tech. We continue by adding another organization of interest, the Protectors of Kronos, or POK. In addition to recommendations around POK, we see a recommended connection between Gas Tech and POK supported by Aisha Vaughn, who has had a role in both organizations. This is suspicious. Cards can be flipped over to see a natural language description for the recommendation. We move the Aisha Vaughn card and execute a pinned interaction. This turns the recommendation into a green seed as an expression of our interest. This triggers further recommendations around Aisha. Cards with additional detail about his connection to POK and Gas Tech can be dropped onto the Aisha seed to accumulate information about him. Cards visualizing Aisha's car movement warrant further investigation, especially given his movement at night. 
In addition to recommendations surfacing in the workspace, Active Data delivers recommendations which are geospatial in nature to Google Earth automatically. Each recommendation is a layer which can be used in combination with the existing Kronos points of interest layer. We hide Aija's car movements generally to focus on his movement at night. We see he visits the homes of two missing gas tech employees, Ada and Willem. We can pin these locations to our workspace from within Google Earth. These two locations trigger recommendations. We dismiss cards for nearby places which aren't important to us. We double-click the visitor's card near Willem's home to see all 27 records. In addition to Aija, we see a new suspect, Henny, who visits the home of Willem. From Excel, we can right-click and pin to our workspace. On the workspace, we move the Henny seed near Aija as our hypothesis that they are suspects builds. We now execute a series of interactions to clean up the workspace to focus on the four individuals explored so far. Our theory is that Aija and Henny are suspects, with some evidence of them surveilling possible victims Ada and Willem. To express our theory visually, we add a group called suspects. We add Aija and Henny to the group by touching the seed nodes to the group node. They take on the group color, blue, to show membership. Active Data now recognizes the higher level task we are performing, investigating suspects. Task models now look for data related to coordination among suspects, which results in a summary of their email exchanges and visits to other homes. Similarly, we create a group called Victims. We add Ada and Willem to the group. This triggers our highest level task model, which recommends a connection between suspects and victim groups. The six records, visualized as a spark line, are evidence of suspects visiting the homes of victims. In summary, we have demonstrated the active data environment's ability to support analysis through a spatial workspace where the user and the system can express information together. All right, give Alex a round of applause for his work. We've got about 10 more minutes for questions and answers. So if, um, if you have any to anyone, whoever's left, any questions? No questions, okay. All right, I should note a couple more things, actually. So the, the VIS group really runs three different labs. The information interfaces group that Dr. Stasco runs. Uh, Alex Ennett runs the visual analytics lab. Uh, and I run the computational enterprise science lab. We're all on the third floor. And we are actually building out right now a VIS lab right across our offices which will um, have a series of fantastic equipment for all of you to um, experiment with and participate in. And we have uh, weekly meetings. So uh, please reach out to any of us, any of the students, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you.